For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sadna, here to unpack his column titled Revolutionary or Emancipatory Consciousness and Activity from the Rivonia Trial to the 1976 Uprising, Part 3. So you refer to the common narrative in histories of this period, depicting it as one where the ANC and its allies had been eliminated or were invisible. And in challenging this, is it not predominantly your loyalty or is it the evidence for ANC's existence that is hard? Most of the history books looked for the ANC and its allies in uh, to be visible, to be in public life. Now, by definition, if you are underground, you are not visible. If you blow up something, you then disappear afterwards. If you issue pamphlets, you disappear afterwards. So the way our researchers were looking for the presence of the under ANC was not appropriate for an organization that was illegal. ANC had a lot of trouble uh, preparing itself for underground. It didn't. It was partly prepared from the M plan from the early 1950s. But when it was banned, a lot of people wanted to continue wearing the organization's colors, a whole lot of things like this. But the people who went underground, if they were to be successful, they would not have been seen by researchers. And it's really uh, later that one has been able to conduct interviews uh, with people about this. You know, if you look at the archives of that period, there's not a lot of evidence that the archives yield, uh, except memoirs and things like that that are unpublished or published. But the people who were around at that period, uh, my work was to interview them in various parts of the country. And what they confirmed was that they did indeed uh, set about creating underground units, especially with veterans like Master Sulu, John Kader Meng, about whom there's a new book coming out now, and people like that. And you speak of the ANC members and its supporters initiating armed activity before the formation of the Umkonto Wesizwe and Mandela's fears that the leadership would be outflanked and lose control with dangerous arising. So is it true that the leadership was in fact ready and were they united on the idea of forming the Umkonto Wesizwe? And also were they not in disagreement? There was burning of cane fields and things like this by people who must have been uh, anti-apartheid or possibly ANC supporters. The leadership were initially not in agreement, especially some of the most important people like uh, Chief Albert Lutuli and uh, Moses Kotani. Now, Mandela uh, knew that if he could change Kotani's mind, then Kotani would sway a lot of people. And Kotani, it's very interesting, Moses Kotani was a leading, the leader of the Communist Party, but he, uh, it was underground. But he and Chief Lutuli were very, very close. It is said that Lutuli would not do anything without uh, checking with Moses Kotani. So he contacted Kotani and said he wants to come over. He spent the whole night there persuading him. And he said to Kotani, you know what happened to the Communist Party in Cuba? It got outflanked by other forces because it did not take part in the rising. And he said, we don't want the Communist Party in South Africa to be in that situation. And then staying up the whole night, at the end of it, Kotani agreed not to support it, but that he would say nothing. Uh, so that was the one uh, very, very important person. People like Kotani believed that the time of peaceful struggle was not over and it would be reckless to get involved in armed struggle. And 
other methods should be fully exhausted and he didn't believe that they had been. You must remember that Mandela was a little bit impatient because he and Sisulu, uh, about five years earlier, when Sisulu went to China, they agreed without consultation to consult the Chinese, to get arms from the Chinese. This is about 1955 or something like that. Then he went to see Chief Lutuli. Now, Chief Lutuli uh, was uh, not a pacifist, but he was very strongly in favor of use of nonviolent methods because he believed that it was important uh, that we have as little bloodshed as possible. There's enough, there was enough bloodshed caused by the apartheid regime. He did not want the ANC to engage in a type of struggle that would cause more bloodshed. So he was resistant to this. But they then had a broader meeting, a secret meeting, because the ANC was banned by then, in what was then Natal. And by the end of the meeting, the chief was persuaded to go along with it. But he was not going to himself identify, uh, be identified with armed struggle, but he accepted it. And the evidence that I have uh, published an article in South African Historical Journal in 2010, uh, he actually did assist that armed struggle because when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, according to his son-in-law, they used that money to buy farm in Swaziland to be used for people who were in exile, presumably also people who were MK. So the chief did not simply accept it and do nothing. He did use that. The only other thing they spent that money was one to buy a flat for one of the daughters in Durban. I don't think it, it, there was this unity, but I think they came to an agreement and people were behind armed struggle. And lastly, Raymond, you referred to the Black Consciousness Movement in the 1976 uprising, but your emphasis seemed to be on how they were influenced by and came under the sway of ANC veterans. So is this not another way of downgrading their importance? Yes, no, it's an important um, question in the sense that we should not see the role of black consciousness in that period as simply uh, being on the way to be becoming absorbed in their proper home, being the ANC. They were not there simply as preparing the way for the ANC and preparing the way for themselves to go into the ANC. One of the points that I make in the article is that the black consciousness movement, and it's also true of the PAC, they may not be very strong organizationally, but they've left a lasting mark on South African society and in fact continue to have an impact. Their ideas continue to resonate with very many people. And in the ANC itself, a lot of the people who came in from black, the Black Consciousness Movement have brought in values which I think they woke people up from certain assumptions that they'd had with a sort of strident uh, emphasis on blackness and not seeing it as incompatible with non-racialism. So that I, I think there is that danger of seeing the black consciousness movement as simply being en route to joining the ANC. It was more than that, and it still is. That was Professor Raymond Sadna speaking to Krima Media's Polity about revolutionary or emancipatory consciousness and activity from the Rivonia trial to the 1976 uprising part three.